After waiting with bated breath, the Presidential Election Tribunal has dismissed the petition filed by the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and its presidential candidate, Atiku Abubka. And Namdi Kanu is not giving up on IPOB, yes, because he took his agitation for the actualization of a sovereign state called Biafra to the European Union Parliament. Now this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anakon. After weeks of waiting and anticipation from both the APC and the PDP, the Presidential Election Tribunal rules in favour of President Muhammad Buhari. The judgment by the five-member tribunal was read by Garba Muhammad. The tribunal ruled each of the five arguments by the PDP and Atiku Abubakar against them. Well, some of the results of the ruling was expected. Uh, well, I'm no fortune teller, and that is why I'm being joined by Raymond Nkanebe and Shegun Shopitan uh, to discuss the rulings. Good to have you guys join us. Thank you. Okay. So I'll start with you, Raymond, because yes. you're a lawyer and you've been involved in some election petition at the state's levels, okay. I guess. Okay. So you have an idea of how this process works. Sure. Of course, if you are of the Atiku camp, you would be very hopeful that something good will come. You wouldn't go to court if you already know that you're going to lose, I'm guessing. Uh, but there's some of these rulings that some people say they already saw it coming and there's some that a, a couple of people are saying we need to proceed to the Supreme Court. Give us a basic uh, knowledge of what actually happened because we were watching all day. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, just as you said, naturally the petitioners would have expected um, that the petition would turn out in their favor. But then wishes are not always horses. Uh, basically, Petitions are judged by their grounds upon which they are predicated, and then the reliefs that the petitioner is seeking. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at the grounds of that petition um, against the reliefs that was sought by the petitioners, um, those who understand the, how the process works uh, knew that it was not going to fly because um, one, the petitioners were saying, talking about electronic transmission of results. Well, that was an issue for a long time. If yes. there was a server or there was no server. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And you saw what the court has come out to say today. Because what they were saying was not captured as it were today in the body of our laws, right? So the Internet Guidelines and Electoral Act has, not, has no provision for electronic transmission of results. Everything that has to do with results from the polling unit up to the world, up to the local government coalition centers and to the states and leading up to the National Coalition Centre is a manual process. And that's why if you remember during the election period, you had people coming from Rex, coming from, sorry, um, returning officers coming from different states going to Abuja to submit their results. If the process were an electronic process, of course, they wouldn't have to take all those um, trips to Abuja. So on that score, the petition was bound to fail on that leg. And then when you look at the issue of qualification of uh, the president of, yes, the second respondent, Mohammed Buhari, which was another, what many persons perceive as a relatively stronger leg of the petition, given the certificate saga, Cambridge, Army Board, and all of that. But fortunately for the respondent, and unfortunately for the petitioners, the, 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 the section 318 of the Constitution that defines what is a school certificate gives it a very wide meaning, right? So the law says a school certificate means um, uh, SSCE certificate, sorry, first school level certificate or its equivalent. And that equivalent went as far as being described as any, the person who having held a, a public office or he can read, he can write, um, or any, any person who the who ANEC feels uh, is qualified to, to, to run for an office. And when you look at the fact that Buhari has ruled this country as a military leader in the past, and have, uh, he went to Sandhurst to train for his military school and a whole lot of other qualifications, of course, he, it's, it's, beyond, it's beyond doubt that he is qualified to, uh, to contest for... According to the content, according to of, the content that. of the Constitution. Hmm. Right? So, um, and then the petitioners, uh, we're also saying that um, the, the Mr. Mr. President was not, uh, did not score the majority of lawful votes cast, and then they also made allegations of criminal nature against 
certain persons who were not joined as a party in the petition. Yeah, but, and the court is saying that they did not, they were not able to give enough proof. Yes, I, I was leading there because if you make criminal allegations against persons and you don't join them in that action, they are not going to succeed because it will be against the right of fair hearing. That if you say they did this, they ought to be heard and say yes, I did this or I did not do it. So you can't join, you can't make allegations against persons and not make them parties to the petition. And that's why you saw um, uh, several paragraphs of the petition that bordered on criminal allegations had to be struck out. And then, in the event of those paragraphs having been struck out from the petition, naturally it affects the life of the petition because every evidence that we are led on those allegations naturally went to no issue. So when you now look at how the different legs of the petition were crippled, either on technical grounds of legal practice or even um, a lack of sufficient evidence, it was, it was always going to lead to the determination of, of the tribunal. But then um, I, I, I had thought that the court would have made some um, more progressive uh, pronouncement on certain issues, like for example the issue of the card reader and the process of accreditation of of voters at elections. Now, in 2015, there was an amendment to the Electoral Act that deleted Section 52, Subsection 2, that was contained in the 2010 Electoral Act. Mm -hmm. In that act, it said there shall be no electronic voting as a 2010 amendment to the Act. But in 2015, there was another amendment that deleted that provision and now inserted a new provision that voting shall be according to the procedure laid down by INEC, it triggers the question, where is that procedure contained? It is in the INEC guidelines. And the guidelines was issued pursuant to the powers given, by, given to INEC by Section 153 of the Electoral Act. So we had, I had expected the Court of Appeal today to say, okay, in the event of the amendment to the Electoral Act in 2015, having given INEC the powers to lay down the procedure to conduct election. So the election ought to be conducted in line with the provision in the guideline. But we saw the courts still take us back to cases that, we are, that came before this 2015 amendment, talking about use of manual accreditation of voters. So that's an element of the judgment that I thought is not that progressive. And I expect the petitioners to take it up as a first ground of the appeal to the Supreme Court, and let us see if the court, the Apex Court, will be bold enough to depart from those decisions that had before now said the means of accreditation must be manual through the use of voters register. Mm -hmm. You understand? We we'll expect them to say no. It was because of the mischief, because of this high speed of um, electoral uh, uh, rigging as elections. Manipulation. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 uh, Jigal led INEC said no. Let us deploy some sem some semblance of technology and let us limit the accreditation process electronically, so that if 50 persons we are accredited by the card reader, we can't expect more than 50 results in the result sheet for that unit. You understand? So I would expect the Supreme Court in the event this issue comes before them to make a definite pronouncement so that going forward we would know that we have moved uh, uh, beyond that era where we had to do things in a manual way. Shagun, um, he's made very interesting points such as the Supreme Court or the Appellate Court be bold enough. Uh, I want to underline the word bold. If there be a vagueness in some of these pronouncements, what should we be expecting from the Supreme Court? And in terms of you know, some of these pronouncements, can they really hold water if they be taken to the Supreme Court? Um, well, I mean, first of all, I'm not a lawyer. I know. <laughs> so I need to make that clear. But, I mean, we're knowledgeable enough about how things run. We've witnessed this. And things. we participate in and elections. We participate in elections. We've seen cases go to Supreme Court. We've had conversations with lawyers, and he's here who will attest to what I'm about to say. Um, the case will go to the Supreme Court, I expect. I think it should, um, so that we can enrich the process and determine certain issues, take them out of the realm of conjecture and debate. Let, because once the Supreme Court makes a pronouncement, it becomes part of our law. Right? So I hope that PDP and Article will take this to the Supreme Court. Um, however, I don't think that much will come out of that. And this is why I say that. Typically, my understanding of how 
um, um, in terms of hierarchy of the courts, how they run, is um, the Supreme Court will be examining the decision made based on the reliefs sought and looking for errors in law. Like, OK, yes, you made a mistake in looking at it like this. Why didn't you look at it like this? The Supreme Court cannot add to what the PDP has presented to the lower court. So it will be very, very difficult. So the point that he made, great, you know, that would be ideal. Would like to get a pronouncement, a definite pronouncement on the card reader. Can we, using the instrumentality of the Supreme Court, make it a part of our law? So that is no longer optional. Because right now it still is, right? But unfortunately, I don't think I don't think that um, the PDP and um, Alaji Atiku mm. made an issue of the card reader matter in itself. It wasn't one of the issues that they tried to determine. I think, um, they, I think they did. It was. Okay, they did. So Actually, if they, they did talk if, about if, it. Yes. If they did, yes. then it would be fantastic. Because yes. I think that that's something that the Supreme Court can then yes. make a more, a, a clearer declaration on. Um, beyond, and I guess that's why he's saying that, beyond what, the, what this court has done is to say, you've not presented enough evidence for almost everything that you've asked me to declare on your behalf, you haven't proven it beyond reasonable doubt, sure. right? Which is fair. Now, um, the Supreme Court can go a step further and say, well, yes, you didn't prove this. However, this is in the best interest of society. They rarely do that. But it will be very, very good for us to see that happen. So that um, pending when President Wari eventually, hopefully, signs the 2015 amendment, um, you know, the, mostly the 2018 amendment mm -hmm. to the Electoral Act, pending that time, that at least our laws, our election laws, are improved to a certain degree. So that, you know. uh, and you just made mention of something which I like to um, pick up on. Mm. They rarely do it. And so we look at antecedents, whether we like it or not. If the Supreme Court rarely thinks in that direction, why should we be expecting that something magical will happen to change that stance? I'm just wondering if they don't go out of their comfort zone to mm. make such corrections, why should we be expecting yes, any? Well, I, I would think, uh, given the peculiar circumstance of this, of, of this case. I'm sure they, most of most cases are peculiar in nature. No, I mean, they might want to Especially because... Especially when no, it comes to election because tribunal cases. I know the Supreme Court, they rarely want to depart from their previous decisions, so they will not disturb the state of the laws. Mm -hmm. But what is before us is a clear position, one of the exceptional cases where the Supreme Court would have to overrule itself, which is what? When there has been a change in the law. Now, all the most of the authorities that they are, their lordships of the Court of Appeal we are reading now today, we are based on the 2010 amendment. The cases of Okon, Vat Omana, Elechi, Ucha, Elechi, uh, Faleke, uh, they were all cases that were decided based on the 2010 amendment to the act. But there has been a 2015 amendment that now said voting shall be in line with the procedure laid down by INEC. And in the final address of the petitioners, which I had the privilege to look at, they made a serious case of that, telling their lordship that, my lord, these cases are no longer valid for the times. They are as valid to the extent that they were decided based on what the law was. But as of today, there's a new law. So those authorities will no longer be valid authorities. So this is a case where the Supreme Court will be said, okay, let us look at, oh, there has been a change. So this change should now might alter our previous decisions, right? Because the principle of star decisis, that is the binding precedent of the, of the Supreme Court decision, is based on similarity of facts and similarity of the law. You understand? So those authorities might not be valid, might not be opposite for now, because mm -hmm. they were predicated on a law that has now been changed. So I, I would think the Supreme Court might be tempted to. I, I want to push further. Again, <laughs> I'm not learned. Shegun and I are on the same <laughs> level. But uh, in this instance, when you're taking a case to the Supreme Court, I just want you to educate me and whoever is watching. OK. Do you have to? bring fresh or additional facts or proof to buttress your point or what you did at the appellate court or it's just going to be determined based on what had been presented on at the lower court okay well the appellate system the appellate process is we call it it is a, it is not a retrial it is rehearing 
Uh -huh. You understand? So what the Supreme Court will do is just, what the, the petitioners will do now, who will now be the appellant, they will look into the judgment of this court and identify errors of law, errors of fact, or what we also call errors of mixed law and fact. Mm -hmm. They will now form what we call grounds of appeal. Their lordships heard when they heard that the 2015 Amendment to Electoral Act is not to be used for this election. Their lordships heard when they said the card reader will not be used for accreditation. These are issues of law and mixed law and fact. Their lordships heard when they said we did not need enough evidence to vindicate our allegations. These are grounds of complaint. So they will now flesh out an issue out of it and submit to the Supreme Court. Maybe they will say, whether in the light of evidence they led at the Court of Appeal, whether the Court of Appeal was right in holding this is in form of a question. So they will advance argument in furtherance of that proposition. Why the respondent, that's like Buhari Ainek and his party, will also argue in the obvious, trying to support the decisions of the Court of Appeal today. Mm -hmm. You understand? Why the petitioners will argue against this. So the Supreme Court will just compare their arguments and then look at the decision of the Court of Appeal today and see whether the complaints made by the appellant are actually uh, 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 accords with the position of the law and then make a finding either for the appellant, either affirming the Court of Appeal decision or setting it aside and making their own uh, uh, findings of fact and law. So since this case is out of court, we can actually piss it, you know, <laughs> tear it apart. Yes. Let's start by looking at some of the mistakes that you think were made, you know. For example, I've heard stuff like that we were even talking about how many witnesses had to be called to the stand. And, and we know how much time it is to take an for an electoral, uh, election tribunal to hold. Yeah. Let's start with that, calling witnesses from how many local government areas again? Well, yeah, 7,420,000 um, polling units. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so um, there, there was a limit to how much they could have done, you know, in the circumstances given the sheer size of the country geographically, um, structurally, process-wise. The process itself is massive, right? So th 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 there are some limitations there. But I, I think they could have done better in terms of representation um, of the areas where they felt there were significant uh, malpractices. They didn't present enough witnesses from those places. They were relying, it was almost as if um, the whole PDP and article case was relying on star, the, the concept of star witnesses. They had some big guys that had you know, a lot of information and all that, and they were presenting, and they were depending on what those guys had to say. And under cross-examination, those guys fell apart. Um, you had my namesake, um, Shegun, uh, I forget his show me. Show show me. me. You know, very eloquent guy, fantastic speaker, intelligent and all that. Yeah. You know, he said a lot of things, but unfortunately, when under cross-examination, you see lawyers, I mean, he's a lawyer, they're very smart people. So <laughs> they were trying to pin him down yeah. to show it's that specific. he was dead. You saw it. You can't, you know, because you can't be a witness and say somebody said. It must be something that you saw. Right, so he was now left with having to rely on situation room reports, which is a completely different thing from I was, I was there. there. So if um, the PDP had, for instance, brought in a whole lot more of their polling agents from, you know, let's say, you know, we've got 36 states, um, take two or three local governments in every single state. Make sure you represent every state. They didn't. There were 17 states that no witnesses were called from. 17. I mean, that's massive, right? So. It made it easy. They made the job of the the judges a bit easy, yeah. a bit too easy. It was too easy to say, you know, you didn't you didn't try hard enough mm. to prove your case, you know. So so that's one. And then I think even from the very beginning, from the kind of statements that um, Alaji Atikwabaka himself made when he was declaring that he was going to go to um, the tribunal, I thought, oh come on, you can't come from that angle. So th there were some. Um, almost emotional um, 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 uh, basis for some of their angst and for some of their uh, displeasure. Like, for instance, saying something like, um, how can the president win one million votes in Borono? 
when Boko Haram is there. Mm, attacked on that morning. When, you know, I mean, uh, Boko Haram attacked, uh, you know, did they get that number from IDP camps? Yes, that might sound a bit rational. But you have to, you can't just make an assumption. You can't pluck that from the air. Proof. You must have evidence that one million people did not come out. You can't just make an assumption. There were there were a lot of assumptions in a lot of things that. I, I, and I'm wondering, that, in an election uh, where you were said. allowed to take pictures of the results or how many people showed up, and you know, it shouldn't have been a difficult. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here. It shouldn't have been difficult to be able to present some proof if you had any. I mean, I think INEC allowed for people to take pictures before the collation itself actually happened. So I'm wondering, what well, do you think they well, heard? Uh, I think um, in all fairness to the petitioners, I think they did a good job of the assignment they were given. And uh, they had a very uh, difficult task to dislodge a, an election of a national spread. It has not happened in the history of this country. And, and we've had several, we have several petitions, including every, the every sitting president election. has yeah. been Even to court elections, many times. Elections that border on just maybe just one constituency, it's always very difficult to prove it. You understand? Because the state of the law as of today does not favor the petitioners. You get, you have 14 days, sometimes less than 14 days to prove your case as a petitioner. Most times, you cannot go to court to challenge an election without having seen documents. You understand? So election is announced, results are announced today. You take steps, maybe you take, you have 21 days to file your petition. Most times you don't, INEC, INEC withholds the documents you need for you to maybe flesh out your case. The electoral forms, voters registers, and all those materials you need to contest an, an election. They will told it for you. Maybe when you have scarcely nine days to the expiration of 21 days, they give it to you. What can you do in just nine days? Before you struggle to analyze the document to get your case laid out, you're already, you're already a, 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 a handicapped already. So when you are able to now get the petition to court, you have less than between 10 to 14 days. If you are challenging an election of, let's say, of a national spread like this, where you are, uh, you are challenging over 120,000 polling units, how many witnesses can you call? Cases in court turn on evidence and not sentiment. Though there are lordships on the election, they might be watching, seeing where people are taking ballot boxes in the comfort of their homes. Mm. But when they go into the chambers yeah. and sit as judges, they have to deal based on facts before them. You get. He mentioned about show me Mr. Chidoka and other persons who we call in law as um, omnipresent witnesses who would say, I was here, I was here, I moved around. You can't, how, how much can you move around? So your evidence should be limited to what you saw. So if you spoke about what happened in the whole of Lagos State, but you are only present in 10 polling units in Lagos State, the evidence you led in the other polling units will go to no issue. So if in such a situation, what would the petitioner do? So that's why I think it, the, 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 the bulk has to stop right at the bulk of INEC. I have argued in the past that it is almost an exercise in fertility to go to the court challenging an election because I understand how the system is. You can't win it. Even though you win at the first court, at the Court of Appeal, they might look at Oshun, what happened in Oshun State. At the tribunal, the guy won, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court, and today he's not the governor. You understand? So let INEC get it right from the, from the start. Let us put in place a legal framework that will make the electoral process more seamless. I, so, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to sound like a preacher of doom, but <laughs> I, I feel like I've heard this before. Let the let INEC do this. INEC needs to do this. <laughs> we do we say this yeah. after every petition election, election cycle. Pe cycle. Yes, we say INEC needs to do this, and then we come back and we repeat the same thing. And after that, so for me, I don't know. Is this enough? Yeah. Well, that's why the legal framework has to be there. INEC, you know, in, in fairness to them, I see uh, an effort tending towards changing, you understand, getting things done in a better way. Throughout today's proceedings, I was looking at Mary Abamuche Mbu, who was in court. I saw her face, her face betrayed the fact that she was not comfortable that election they conducted had to make its way to this level of advocacy. That's what I made out of her, of her facial impression. So I think if the legal framework is put in place. And that's why the Mr. President, after this whole legal um, uh, horse trading, 
must move the National Assembly, must sign the Amendment to Electoral Act, put the legal framework in place, and then let INEC be now be held against not benefiting from that process that has been made possible for them. If we get it right from that angle, it will be easier proving elections in the, in the courts. We always talk about the political will to do a lot of things. If there was political will, Mr. President should have signed this before we even went into the elections. Of course, of course. And even as we speak, months into, well, the year is about to end, we still haven't seen that as one of his top priorities. Maybe because, you know, we're not close to elections, so maybe that's why it's not a top priority? Yeah, I mean, look, um, what has to happen now is that um, people like you, I say you figuratively, the press, yeah. um, people like us, um, the social commentators, civil society. Mm -hmm. civil society, the legal practitioners need to put tremendous pressure on this government to sign that law. Because that law, apart from a couple of things that I thought were, were a bit political, was a fantastic law. It was headed in the right direction. It wasn't there I yet. I agree. Because where we are supposed to be, ma, is electronic voting. That's, that's where the rest of the world, in, in various variants, you know, nobody has, I mean, for instance, there is no country I'm aware of in the world where you can sit in your house and just send a text message like some people are saying. You know, it's difficult because of the issue of identity validation. Well, in the US, right? there's some states that are doing e-voting. You, know, you might but, do by post and all that. But sometimes they even you know. reverse it and, yeah. and still so, have to so, go out. So that's where whatever um, um, hybrid of going electronic that we can go as far as we can, we need to push that border as far as possible so that this issue, because when he was talking, I was just thinking, come on, it's, you, you can't prove your case in court. Mm -hmm. You don't have enough time, and you can't have enough time, because we also don't want a situation where somebody will, yeah, I mean, um, uh, Peter B. Yeah, and, uh, three years, uh, Gigi. Uh, Gigi. You know, you, you spend three years in office, mm -hmm. and then you get all of that rubbish and cancelled. You know, we don't want that. So we want, ideally, we want your... Our, our tribunal cases to even finish before inauguration of the government, sure. right? Yeah. But that would be very difficult when you're even going manual. Yeah. How do you gather all the documents? It's, it's, I mean, when they bring in the, the, the documents can fill this room, <laughs> right? So it's <laughs> crazy. Yes, it's so we need to move away from this. Yes, Get INEC to begin to test run. This is actually urgent mm -hmm. because we've got two elections coming uh -huh. up in November. We only have urgencies when it's close it's to the election. Yeah, but we have two elections now. Uh, well, Kogi well. and Bayelsa. So it's an opportunity for INEC to begin to test. The we list. always say this. I'm sorry, guys. But yeah, I know. I am, I am not pessimistic. <laughs> I'm just being a realist. Well, we think... always say this. Remember the Anambra State election yeah. two years ago? We said, oh, this is mm, good because going to be a litmus yeah, yeah. test mm. to see what this, uh, you know, INEC is going to do. <laughs> and they show. failed. It's, it's, I mean, I'm sorry. It's they crazy. failed. INEC failed. It's so It's crazy. Well, I think I want, I want to point out one of the unintended consequences of today's judgment. Quickly. We don't yes, have I'll do that quickly. Now, across the states, different state governorship petitions as will be delivered in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, these decisions will be a binding authority on those tribunals. Mm. So what it, means, it, what, it mean, what it means is that judges who are expecting the Court of Appeal to make a progressive step in their findings today and seeing them take the conservative approach will be forced to, oh, they are not even, let us go back and do it the way we used to do it. You understand? So that is one of the, those, those are one of the unintended consequences of today's uh, judgment. Well, as for me, this conversation will continue. We'll put pressure on INEC. We have to keep talking because we cannot make it business as usual. But I want to say thank you, Raymond Kanebe and Chegu Supriton. We'll take a short break. They're not going anywhere. When we come back, we'll be talking about Namdi Kanu and the iPop dream. Stay with us.